Welcome to the conversation with Al McFarland. I'm your host, Al McFarland. So instead of presenting you a live program today, I'm sharing with you one of my favorite episodes, uh, a, sh a show that shows you how we've molded the show that you've come to know and love. And while you're enjoying this show, I'm going to be working with my team to make the program even more informative, more insightful, and even more inspiring. And if you haven't already, I'd like you to show your support for the conversation with Al McFarland by subscribing to the Insight News YouTube channel. This way you'll get alerted about and never miss new episodes, show clips, and special features only available on the Insight News channel. And you can find us on YouTube at Insight News MN. To make it easier, I've got a link in the description on this video. Well, thank you again for all your support this year. I can't wait for you to see all that we are preparing for 2023. Now, my friend, sit back and enjoy this conversation with Al McFarland. As we talk about and celebrate the change in narrative of Black African people in Minnesota, in the nation and in the world. I am super excited, as you know, and as I know many of you are, I have the honor and privilege of meeting Saba Dr. Milana Karinga back in 1994 and spending a week at the Kaweida Institute in study with the community there. We again returned in 2000, I believe 1999, 2000, with a group of students from the Imhotep Science Academy and was greeted by Dr. Karinga, who was gracious in his interacting and even doing a brief lecture with the students, which have left an impact on many of them even to this day. As you can see, a lot, all of us were young. You still look the same, Dr. Karinga, but Many of us have lots of gray now, including some of the younger people, you wouldn't even recognize them. But it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, our brother, Elder Al McFarland, who continues to provide the authentic images, stories, and news about our black community here in Minnesota. Um, Al McFarland is the executive director I'm sorry, Al McFarlane is the, the editor-in-chief of Insight News and a CEO at McFarlane Media Interest, Inc., both housed at the Marcus Garvey House, located in North Minneapolis. He is a journalist, news reporter, editor, content creator, and curator of many multimedia vehicles, such as the partnership with KFAI Radio, hosting weekly conversations with Al McFarlane which also is a daily podcast. Insight News is also on the World Wide Web and serves not only Minnesota, but serves the African diaspora with its outreach and news content. Elder McFarlane works in the proud Black press tradition of courageous journalism, creating a historical record and a Black perspective which serves as a knowledge foundation for future generations and serves as a catalyst for change in our society. Al, Al McFarlane currently is the editor for an upcoming anthology publication for the black community and the media to be released in the fall 2020 at the In Black Inks Sankofa series event. I welcome you and thank you and this is gonna be an awesome discussion. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Elder Al. Thank you so much. And thanks to Sen Anura and to uh, Sen Net um, uh, Raquette uh, for this beautiful invitation and chance to exchange with our sisters and brothers across uh, the country and all the people who are guests, all people of goodwill, all people who are seeking to do what we call bring good into the world and not let any good be lost as taught by our ancestors in the sacred text of the Ifa. So let's start with the definition of culture and, and thank you, uh, uh, 
brother and Mr. McFarland, thank you so much for this uh, uh, and for your moderation. So culture, uh, from a Kaweda point of view, my philosophy of work, uh, of life, work, and struggle says that culture is the totality of thought and practice by which a people creates itself, celebrates, sustains, and develops itself, and introduces itself to history and humanity. And so if we look at that, we see that culture gives us identity, purpose, and direction. It tells us who we are, it tells us what our tasks are, and then it tells us how to do it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive ways. And so let's look at it. Culture teaches us that we create ourselves, we bring ourselves into being by what we do and do not do. And that's why it's important for us to understand that at the heart of all we do, this is our task, to know our past and honor it, right? And that includes our culture. To know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical, uh, effective, and expansive way. So we create ourselves, we bring ourselves into being. We celebrate ourselves. We reaffirm ourselves. We reaffirm our beauty, our goodness, our sacredness. And we write ourselves, we sing ourselves, we dance ourselves, and we demonstrate how beautiful it is to be Black, right? And it shows again that uh, we believe and know that there's no people history more holy than ours, no people's life more sacred, no people more holy or chosen or elect than Black people, right? And certainly we know that there's no culture richer or more ancient than ours. We're the people who stood up first, spoke the first human truth, introduced some of the basic disciplines of human knowledge in the Nile Valley, and taught the world what was good and beautiful. And people from all around, Jews, Gentiles, Hittites, Hyksos, Roman, Greek, Persians, they all came to learn, to study, and to draw from this infinite well of African civilization in ancient Egypt. And Egypt was called the light of the world for its knowledge, the womb of the world for its constant creations, and then the temple of the world for its deep spirituality and ethics. And so when we talk about culture, we see how important it is. And it's the way we sustain ourselves, the way we have demonstrated this adaptive vitality, this resilience and resourcefulness comes from our culture. The production of our heroes and heroines. We just celebrated uh, Nana, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. And I always tell people, don't let people extract him from his culture, from his people. It is his culture that made, and his people that made him who he is, right? And that each culture has both a particular and a universal message. And each great person has both a particular and universal message. The particular message is for the people from whom the message and the messenger came, right? But because it represents the best of that people and the best of what it means to be human, in this case, the best of what it means to be African and the best of what it means to be human, it speaks to the goodness of the world. And it makes people say, oh, I can unite with that. I, I see uh, the beauty of that, the depth of that. And so I think that's what's important about our culture. So again, culture is the totality of thought and practice by which a people creates itself, celebrates, sustains, and develops itself and introduces itself to history and humanity. And I give a comprehensive a definition of culture, which includes at least seven basic things. Our spirituality and ethics, sometimes summed up as religion, our history, our, econ uh, our social organization, our economic organization, our political organization, our creative production, which is our art, music, literature, uh, dance, et cetera. And then our ethos, the collective psychology achieved through practice and achievements on, in the other six areas. So that's why culture is important. It gives us, again, identity, purpose, and direction. Uh, because the question we say at the end of Kwanzaa, uh, we say we have to sit down on the last day called Siku Yatamuli, hmm? day of meditation. And we must ask ourselves constantly, who am I? Am I really who I am? 
And I'm all I ought to be. Who am I in history? Who am I in relationship? Who am I in culture, right? Am I really who I am? Because the oppressive society makes us, Fanon said, not in France, Fanon said, makes us wear the mask, right? And so sometimes we disguise ourselves. You know, sometimes we disfigure ourselves. Fanon says sometimes that people who are oppressed and cannot make it go to uh, several, and this is a Kawhi interpretation of his right, go to several um, stages of personality disintegration. First, they doubt themselves, right? Then they deny themselves. Then they mm, condemn themselves. And finally, they mutilate themselves. So who has not? in the face of white racism. And by racism, I don't mean racial prejudice, prejudice, hatred and hostility towards those different and vulnerable. I mean, turning that hatred and hostility into public policy and socially sanctioned practice, actually encoding it into law, right? And into a socially sanctioned practice. So what we need to do is to not doubt ourselves in the second, uh, deny yourself. Well, I'm not really black. You know, I'm mixed with 50 different things. Well, you know, only black people discuss this, right? It's not like that's self. One becomes, you know, one has to face the fact that that's a self evidence right here. When people start talking about what they're not black, et cetera, is that the very fact that you find it an issue represents that you come from a community who's made to deny itself and doubt itself and to condemn itself and to mutilate itself. And when you say condemn yourself, oh, we're our worst enemy. How can we be our worst enemy? The people who created the Holocaust of enslavement on us, imposed us, and systematic racism, racism, uh, a system of denied defamation and destruction of a people's history, humanity, and right to freedom based exclusively or uh, primarily on the species, the false concept of race, because race stripped of all, and I'm not talking about peoplehood. I'm an African. That's peoplehood, right? But race is something Europeans created in the 17th century to justify and to facilitate their oppression. And so race becomes, in which we strip it of all this pseudoscientific mystification, race becomes a social biological category used to assign human worth and social status using white people as the model. In other words, the closer you are to white people, the higher your human worth and the higher your social status, and the further you are away from uh, white people, the lower your human worth and the lower your social status. That's why people doubt themselves, deny themselves, and then they condemn themselves, and finally they mutilate themselves, right? Take knives to their nose, chop off their cheek, you know, do something to their hair and lips in order to not be seen as not worthy, right? And so what does it mean for people to hate you and you haven't ever done anything to them? How do you get used to that? How do you get used to people who need to stand on your head in order to get height. That's, we can't get used to it. And then when people bleach their skin, not because they're in love with the color white and drink milk every day, it's they don't want to be penalized for being different, right? And the racism requires that they be penalized. And racism is this system involves three basic things, imposition, ideology, and institutional arrangement. It's an imposition, first and foremost, violence physical violence, psychological violence, sexual violence, all kinds of violence. And then second ideology to justify the violence, right? That is by trying to inferiorize and dehumanize and deculturalize the people they're doing it to. And then inst institutional range mean policies, practices, structures that promote and perpetuate both the imposition and the ideology. And the ideology can come not only in everyday conversation, but in the educational system, in, in the religious conversations that they've had over the years, right? And so what we need to do is always know we have to define ourselves. So I came into being in struggle. That's how I came into being. I came into being first studying what it means to be African and getting tired, actually surfeited with European self-congratulatory narrative posing as a curriculum, right? And so I'm asking myself with I, I, I encountered the Honorable Marcus Garvey. And Nana Garvey says to us, where is the black man and woman's king and kingdom? Where is the uh, Navy and Army? Where are there big men and women of, where are there women and men of big affairs? I said, I could not find them and I would help make them. So I'm inspired by this. And then as this is happening, we have the rise of the African nations. In fact, I ran into Garvey studying in, ju in junior college, we call it junior college, but it's community college now. 
uh, studying the community of college, I ran into the Honorable Marcus Garvey through Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, not a, uh, Kwame Nkrumah. And he was talking about Garvey and how Nana Garvey affected his life. And I began to read the Honorable Marcus Garvey, right? And, and uh, uh, the Honorable Marcus Garvey said, I'm coming back in the whirlwind. And I reasoned then and only writ, uh, writ, wrote it later because we were so busy, we didn't write in the beginning. We just mainly lectured. Uh, I started writing at the end of the 60s, but uh, we used to just lecture, right? And so, <clears throat> Gobi said he's coming in the whirlwind. And I said, we are the whirlwind. We must be the whirlwind that facilitates his return, right? And when Martin Luther King says, I won't get to the promised land, uh, but you'll get there. Well, if we get there, he gets there because we bear him within us. We bear the lesson and the legacy. That's how we embrace it, by living the legacy he left us. So I'm very uh, uh, overwhelmed with this whole idea of the movement. Everything took place in 1965 when the movement begins. Now, I had been in the civil rights phase of the Black Freedom Movement, but I'm now talking about the Black Power Movement. There are two phases to the, the Black Freedom Movement. Uh, 1955 to 1965, the civil rights phase. And what white people have done is actually renamed the Black Freedom Movement to just the civil rights movement and even included Malcolm in there, not a Malcolm X, Haji Malcolm X, even included him in that when he criticized over focus on civil rights and reaffirmed we are fighting for human rights and freedom is a human right. It's not a right the government can give you. It's a right that you are born with. We are born free. We are born in dignity. It's others who would take our freedom from us, deny us our dignity, and again, stand on our head in order to get height themselves, right? If they're that tall, they don't need to stand on our uh, on our heads, what they need to do is speak their own uh, 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 culture and, and measure it by others. Don't erase mine. You know, you don't have to erase me in order to be present, but that's what happened. And so I come into being struggling and, and learning from. And also I'm influenced by the teachings of Haji Malcolm X and ultimately the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, right? And what they did, the Nation of Islam, they gave consciousness to all black people in above their lives and said they weren't infected by, weren't, weren't uh, affected by the teachings of the Nation of Islam, the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Minister Haji Malcolm X. They're not being truthful with themselves because before that, we didn't use the word black. That was like an insult to call somebody black. But the messenger, Messenger Muhammad, Messenger Elijah Muhammad, he sacralized blackness, he demonized blackness. And Ma Nana Malcolm taught that, taught how sacred we were and how we had to see ourselves in the most um, elevated terms. And we aren't second to anybody. And that we must, in fact, take control of our own destiny and daily life, speak our own special culture truth, and make our own unique contribution to how this society is reconceived and reconstructed. And so I'm, I leave um, UCLA at the time of the movement, I am um, uh, at UCLA working on my first doctorate. And I leave because I want to join the movement, right? And so I'm making myself that because I want you to see we make ourselves and we make ourselves in the context of the culture that gives us life and gives us an expansive conception of ourselves. And so what I did was come out uh, to do something, right? I wanted to develop my philosophy. I developed Kwanzaa. I developed the Nguzo Sava. I built my institution, the organization Us. I, I co-founded and helped build the African American Culture Center with the advocates of Us. All of this I do in the context of the organization. And I'm responding to a teaching and call of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. And Nana Mary McLeod Bethune says, knowledge is the prime need of the hour, but people want to know what are you going to do with your knowledge? And she said, it's up to us to discover the dawn and then share it with the masses of our people and our youth who need it most. So we were to take our knowledge and use it to further the interests of our people, to build institutions and practices that in fact push the movement for liberation, the movement for freedom along. And so I said there were two phases to the uh, Black freedom movement. One, 
the Civil Rights Movement, 1955 to 1965, and the Black Power Movement, 1965 to 1975. And I did most of my work in the Black uh, uh, Power Movement. And so what I did was then I began to name myself. I, my first name, I have three African names, Maulana and Davizita Karenga. That's, those are my names. And so I first chose Karenga myself. We need keep up the tradition. So I wanted to be a culture. I had studied uh, African culture in, in college, in, in university, right? And I got deep into it. And then I not only read what was in uh, the books, I used to always say, and I told my students at this, when you go to the white universities that are dominated by white instruction, you got to take two, so, two sets of notes, one to get an A and one to get away. Even if you have to put that trash down on paper, you don't have to believe it. You have to go and do independent study. So I did a lot of independent study and I did independent studies of African cultures and African languages. I focused on Swahili, as you can tell by Kaw the names Kawaida, uh, the name uh, Kwanzaa and Nguzo Saba, because uh, 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 Swahili is a Pan-African language and we're Pan-African. I don't claim one ethnic group or uh, or what people call tribes. I don't claim that. I claim the whole of Africa as my heritage and all African people as my relatives, right? It's my brothers and sisters. And so the whole question was, how do I build on this ancient culture? How do I extract from it best practices? Not only ancient Africa, but also modern Africa. And when I say modern Africa, I'm talking about Africa, not just as a continent, but Africa as a world community the continent and the diaspora, right? And so then I, 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 I chose this name as what I would be doing, keeping the tradition. And writing was part of that to keep the tradition and teaching. So also I'm a teacher, I'm a teacher first, right? Because even to keep the tradition, I have to be a teacher. So my, my uh, members of my organization called Advocates and Us, uh, they gave me the name Master Teacher and that's Maulana. And then a brother from the liberation movement in South Africa, he suggested, given what I was doing and how he evaluated me, that I should take a praise name uh, from Shaka, which is in Dabizija, which means constant concern to the enemy. That the enemy is always concerned about what I'm going to do and what I'm doing because he knows I'm in opposition to them. That's why we named our organization Us. Us, number one, to stress um, our focus on the people first. Second, to draw a line between us and them, them the oppressor, and finally to reaffirm the community and character of our thought and practice, our moral sensitivities also. So we, I did self-naming, I did self-definition, and I did self-assignment, uh, and I began to develop myself. But again, I'd be um, uh, remiss if I did not give my mother and father, my family, uh, credit for you know, setting me on the way. Uh, they uh, laid the foundation uh, for who I am today, taught me how to walk on the upward path of our ancestors and talk to me to speak truth and to do justice and to care for the poor and the vulnerable among us, to honor our elders and our ancestors, to cherish and challenge our children, to, to um, <clears throat> have a rightful relationship with the environment because they were farmers and they loved farming and always talked about the earth itself, right? to have a rightful relationship with the environment and to constantly raise up praise and pursue the good. And it's the struggle after that, that makes me, and also my organization members, my wife, my house, my companion and all things good, beautiful and sacred, Timoya Karinga, well, all of these are so important to who I am. I come into being in relationship, that's an African concept. And I, I really want to share with you also how I began to study classical sources, but I want to stop and make sure that I've answered your first question sufficiently, but I want to go as soon as we can into classical sources, which also helped me to form and strengthen my identity and uh, sense of what I was doing as right by rooting myself in the sacred and depthful teaching of our ancestors. My and one of the things that we, when my house and I, uh, my wife and I began, we began as friends, right? Friends are forever. Wives and husbands leave each other regularly. We know that, right? 
but friends are forever. And a friend means that we want the best for each other. We think the best of each other. We want to share the best for each other with each other. And we work for the best of each other always. And so that's been our relationships from the beginning. And during the uh, movement, she was always there with me. And then when you said I called her, that's before I had enough money to take her everywhere I went. So then once we started, like maybe in the 80s, early 80s, when I started getting the fees I uh, uh, set for, uh, for speaking, I was able to take her everywhere with me. She was always with me. And besides, she wasn't just going to travel with me. She was my agent. She did the booking. She did the work. She did the PR. She did all of it. She advised me as she does now and is responsible for my success. I, I couldn't think. Even before we came together, she was archivist for the organization. Uh, she served on the legal committee and we were always confronting the law. You know that, right? We were political prison. We had to go into exile out of, um, uh, out of the country. We had to go underground. Uh, so she and the other members of the organization were always there for us. And, I, and I'm always, I'm forever grateful uh, for that. And so she is uh, central to who I am and what I am constantly becoming, okay? And so I always think I'm, I'm struggling and being a lifetime learner, always struggling uh, to add more to my life and, and to add more to our life. And let me just, in terms of the classical sources, Africa, that we think of ourselves in relationship, right? People used to say, mm, I am because we are and because we are I am. That's in BT. But Ubuntu then said, um, uh, Ubuntu ungu, Ubuntu ungabantu, which means uh, a person is a person to other people, right? Uh, we accept that. And in Kawiri, we say, I'm related and relate, therefore I am. Now, why do I say I'm related? Because even before I can relate, before I come into being, I'm already in relationship to my mother and father who are producing me and to the ancestors before me. And I'm indebted and related to my siblings who are going to nurture me and help me as long with, uh, along with my mother and father. And I'm indebted to the future as an act of reciprocity because I was given life, because I was nurtured, that I have to leave a legacy worthy of the name and history African for those who come after. That's how we think in our organization, us. And so we get this from also the writings of um, uh, our ancestors before us. And this one is very important to know how rich the oral and written tradition. But I, I talk about three kinds of texts, the oral text, the written text, and the living practice text. So Harriet Tubman is how she lived her life. Nana Harriet Tubman, Nana Harriet Tubman leaves a legacy, not only by the autobiographical things that she had written, but also by the practice in life, how she opened the way for us. In ancient Egypt, we call way openers. We call them, I mean, we call them way makers in African-American culture, but Egyptians call way openers, right? They open the way for us. Uh, and Fannie Lou Hamer called them bridges. And she says it teaches us the morality of remembrance, saying there are two things we should all care about, never to get, never to forget where we came from and always praise the bridges that carried us over. So I just want to share with you the different kinds of writing. So, because we had so much writing before the European came. So European don't teach us how to write, right? In fact, he outlawed our reading and writing. And yet in outlawing our reading and writing, he did not stop us. We still learn ways. And in less than a hundred years out of the Holocaust of enslavement, we created a world-class literature second to none. But look at how long we've been writing these things. The ancient Egyptian texts, right? The Nubian texts, the, the Nubian uh, uh, hieroglyphic texts, but also the Nubian Meridic texts. The texts from uh, the Berbers, the texts from West Africa, right? Where we have the Tadix uh, by uh, Mahmoud Kati and Al Said. So, and then also uh, Nana Amaru, a brilliant uh, African woman uh, scholar 
who wrote poetry, who wrote political commentaries, commentaries on culture and education, right? We have all that. We didn't even know, Malcolm used to say it, but we didn't know how many Muslims were brought in the Holocaust of enslavement here. And they were writers, you know? If we, if we look at them, they, 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 they wrote autobiographies, even in enslavement. We had, you know, like people like, uh, uh, like um, Bilal Muhammad, for example, who was uh, a Jewish prudence expert, right? And who wrote, wrote a text on Jewish prudence. And Al-Hajj Umar, uh, Ibn Said, who wrote a manuscript, an autobiographical manuscript. This is right here in this country in the Holocaust of enslavement. So we have a rich history. But I, I want to start with the ancient Egyptian because that's, that's one of my major things. And that's what my second doctorate is in, ancient Egyptian ethical thought, right? And practice, the moral idea in ancient Egypt of studying Af uh, uh, classical African ethics. So let, let me just take an example of how I define myself in relationship to the, te uh, the uh, classical sources. So Reddy QM uh, says in his autobiographical uh, writings, he says, I'm one who knows myself. This is a question of identity here. We were talking about identity. I know myself, but how does he know himself and how did he make his self-presentation? It is both social and moral. It is what he's achieved, but it is also his character and how he relates to others. So he says, I know myself as a precious timber of the divine, right? I know myself as a vanguard of the people endowed with excellence of nature and great nobility of practice. I'm a possessor of dignity, he said, open-handed, pleasant-mannered, noble in appearance and godly to behold. I'm kind-hearted, open-hearted and open-minded, clear thinking and self-confident. I restored what was in ruins. I repaired what I found damaged. I replenished what I found depleted. It was my heart and mind that advanced my position, but it was my character that kept me there. That's a beautiful way of talking, right? That's identity there. That's identity that's based on thought and practice, on moral sensitivity, thought and practice. And guess what? Relationship to our people. Because all of, almost all the biographies, autobiographies start with, I came from my city. I descended from my district. I did good there. I spoke truth. I did justice. I cared for the poor and the vulnerable. I gave food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, and a boat to those out. I was a father for the orphan, a mother for the timid, right? A shelter for the battered, a sanctuary for the stranger, a raft for the drowning, and a ladder for those trapped in the pit of despair. And take Lady Tiny, who, who says, I'm a possessor of character, she said. I'm one who is also a vanguard of the people one worthy and praise, one beautiful by what comes from my mouth and mind. See, she's speaking truth. She's giving advice to the Pharaoh, right? She's talking about issues that affect society. I am beautiful by what comes from my mouth. Critical and useful advice that is speaking truth. And she says also, I'm one who entered praise and left love. I like that. Always like that. And I, I use that in the Maziko services I perform. Wait, Maziko means funeral services I perform as a savior. And I said, it's beautiful to come into life, praise, but also beautiful to leave loved, right? So everybody's happy to see you as a baby. The question is, what would they think of you in life? And so we should so live our life, Nana Mary McClavethune tells us, that even when we lie down in death, we stand tall on the platform of service. So she goes on to say, I'm one who ended praise and left love. One who speaks reveals her virtue. One who speaks and it is done for her. A person of worthiness justified in the eyes of the divine. That's a beautiful way of talking about it. And of course, the Nubians wrote, I mean, one of the best histories of ancient Egypt and Nubia is Pianchi's mm, uh, narrative of his conquest of, of, of uh, uh, Egypt. And in it, he says one beautiful thing that I use now in terms of both vaccine and the HIV crisis. And he was saying there are two ways before you, life and death, choose life, close down and you die, open up and you live. 
and we must open up to each other. We must care for each other in this pandemic. This gives us a chance to talk about this. And this says, what is the role of the writer, which I want to get to next. And have a chance. What is the role of the writer? And the writer has to speak truth to the people, has to elevate the mind and consciousness of the people, teach them their most expansive self, ground them in their goodness, and talk about the beauty and sacredness of who they are. Nina Simone said it, you know, that I sing for my people. I sing to create their curiosity and where they came from and who they are. She wants us to be curious. She wants us to have consciousness, right? James Baldwin said, oh, I've already gotten into it, so let me go. So James Baldwin said that the writer must illuminate the darkness, blaze through the forest and teach people what it is to be truly human. We have to open up the world for another version of humanity. Fanon says, Fanon writes in his Wretched of Earth, his classic for the sixties and for all time. He said, let us leave you. Well, they're always talking about man, but where they find him, they murder him down every street. We can do anything if we don't imitate you and become an obscene caricature of you. We must think new thoughts. We must engage the question of humanity all over again. And we must dare to strive to set afoot a new man and woman and initiate a new history of humankind. Those are the things I like. And of course, Mary Evans said what we just said now. We have to speak truth to the people, right? We have to free the mind. We have to free the people themselves. And an artist has a role in that. I'll sum it up later, but I just wanted to, I got into it and couldn't stop. But I wanted to say, <laughs> also, 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 I wanted to talk about uh, after we moved from Egypt and Nubia, we could go to Ethiopia. They write Amharic and Gigs. And one of the most important philosophical texts in world history is Hatata by um, uh, uh, Zara Yaakov. And Yaakov uh, talks about, you know, the beauty of being a human being. Uh, he tells us that you know, one of the things we must realize is that we were given the gift to reason and that the divine would not have given us a reason, I mean, given us a life that was not to be examined and to be understood. And so he also argues for the equality of all human beings. And he especially singles out equality between men and women. And he does a critique, even he's a serious Christian, but he did, does a critique of Judaism and Christianity and Islam and of religion in general that does not live up to its full potential and that teaches falsity and that fights with each other over unserious things instead of being attentive to the well-being of humanity and the world. So he critiques these uh, contradictory practices of people professing religion, but not practicing it. And he also does uh, uh, autobiographical uh, uh, narrative um, and talks about education, his exile uh, under the Catholic uh, Emperor uh, Susenius. Uh, so those, those are things. And, and then I, I mentioned the West African writings, the Tariq's, the histories, uh, Tariq al-Fatash uh, by um, uh, Mahmoud Kati. So it, it's contested. Sometimes they say it's by Ibn al-Muqtar, his grandson. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, we still say Mahmoud Kati. And then Tariq al-Sadan uh, was by Abdul uh, al-Sayed. Uh, and this is uh, histories of West African empire, Songhai and Mali or Songhai and Mali. And then of course, uh, there's a lot of treatises uh, on uh, Islamic thought, on education, uh, math, literature. Uh, and uh, Mama Hadiyah uh, has uh, uh, one of the most beautiful libraries uh, in the world on African manuscripts from West Africa. So it's very important for us to recognize this rich history, right? So I, I just want to stop there. Yeah, appreciate what you said, if I understand correctly. I'm thinking, and you know, I have all respect for uh, our, our, our ancestors. Uh, may the good they left last forever. Uh, uh, I want to rephrase that, I, because what you said just now is the key. We don't need to prove anything to our oppressor. Our oppressor cannot be our teacher, right? What do we must do? We, we are the elders of humanity. Uh, these people are new, right? So they don't come and 
you know, give me a lesson, all right? And they don't call me to meet and uh, have me sit naked in the need at their culture table. I come fully clothed in my own culture, speaking my own special culture truth, making my own unique contribution to how this world works and to what it means to be human in the world. A person that can kill 100 million Native Americans and call it simply manifest destiny or the way, way westward cannot tell me about humanity. The person that can commit the Holocaust of enslavement and call it trade, as if no violence is involved in it, as if the defining feature of our Holocaust is not violence, right? Dehumanization, deculturalization, and one of the most inhumane acts in the history of humankind. And to dismiss that with something called trade? I mean, hey, can they tell us about humanity? A society that says a dog is a man's best friend can't tell you about your woman or your man, right? Let's give me if I'm wrong, right? So we have to ask ourselves, what is our relationship to each other? What is our relationship to society? What is our relationship uh, to the world? And what is our relationship to the environment, right? Because what we must see is two main things, African and human good and the well-being of the world. Maybe that's three things, but I see them interrelated. So always we have to say African, because if we say human and don't say African, people will X us, right? We've got to stress and start for where we are. Speaking of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, he made that point. People first, race first, right? And then we can sit down as an equal rather than a supporter and a satellite. And he says education is one of the ways of empowerment, right? And that the education of the masses dictates the future of the people so that education just can't be for an elite. That's why he said, when we talk about aristocracy, we're not gonna have any hereditary aristocracy in Africa. What we need is an aristocracy of service, right? The good you do for yourself lasts no further than you yourself, right? But the good you do for all in common, he said, will take you into eternity. So let's build for eternity so we can live for eternity as the ancient Egyptians said. And they also said this, every day is a donation to eternity and even one hour is a contribution to the future. So let's get busy and we can build the world we want and deserve to live in. And we have models from our own history. We don't have to emulate the European oppressor. I repeat, our oppressor cannot be our teacher. Yeah, we're the only people in the world that can take a boat ride, even a forced boat ride, and lose identity. The Asians don't lose their identity when they come. The Europeans don't lose their identity when they come. Nobody lose their identity but Africans. We're supposed to not be Africans, right? But what is our identity? Our identity is a dual one. Identity is historical origin and social. You determine a people's identity by historical origin and social location. Where did we come from? We didn't come from Mars. We didn't come from Switzerland or France or Germany. We came from Africa. I'm talking about black people, right? And I know that African has been turned so that it means three things now. It can mean what we usually talk about, racial identity or peoplehood identity. It can mean nationality if you belong to an African country. And it can mean continentality if you live on a continent, right? People can say they're African. But when I say African, I'm talking about African. If I want to say something about other people living there, I'll give them an adjective to describe that distinction, right? But when I talk about African, I'm African. Now, isn't it interesting that white people can become Africans with no question, but we can't be Africans even though we are. So I think we must, you know, uh, speaking of King in this time of King, King said, we have to deal with the culture homicide. That's his word. Those are his words. Culture homicide committed against us by the European. And he said, it is as old as history book and as current as a morning paper. And we have to stand up and reaffirm our dignity as African people and say, we're proud of being black and that blackness is beautiful, right? This is king. You won't get that in a, co a corporate commercial, right? You, you won't get that kind of conversation, but that's what I write about to demonstrate he's sensitive to the struggle we are waging during the black power movement, right? He talked strong about this but he also talked about it in the beginning. And there is no great leader that does not love and put faith in the people. Dr. Nana Mary McClabbett said, 
the progress of our people as a race is in precise relationship to the depth of faith in our people held by our leaders. I take that seriously, right? And so we have to love our people, right? We have to sacrifice for our people. And we got, oh, countless examples of that. Uh, from the Holocaust of enslavement with Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass and Nat Turner and Jim Mark Vesey and Nana and, and, and Gabriel Prosser, all the way up to now, to the martyrs like uh, uh, Nana um, Malcolm uh, X, uh, Haji Malcolm X and Nana Martin Luther King. You know, and what did they do? I mean, we one of the things I want us to do when we talk about identity, identity is not just mm, what we are culturally. I'm sorry, identity is not just what we are culturally. It's also how we practice, how we define ourselves. Uh, and so, uh, 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 so when we talk about our history and we talk about what happened to uh, Haji Malcolm and to Nana Martin Luther King. Nina King, I think it's important for us to say not only that they were assassinated, but they were also martyred. They are martyrs as well as victims of assassination. Assassination is what their enemies and the enemies of human freedom did. But what did they do? They martyred themselves. They did not walk away from the struggle. Dr. King was harassed viciously by FBI director Edgar Hoover, and Hoover tried to get him to commit suicide and talked about, oh, I'm going to expose you, I'm going to do all this, right? But he would not, and people tried to kill him. You know, it wasn't just one time. They constantly tried to kill him. They had to always check the plane before it took off, right? But he wouldn't walk away. And, and it's interesting because when, when the people in Montgomery first came to him, you know, he was this uh, a serious petty bourgeoisie brother coming from uh, Boston you know, University. And he said, you know what I mean? I just came down here to preach, you know? But he said, I thought, how can I be a serious Christian and not deal with the least among us? This is Jesus' teaching in Matthew, right? We, we will judge you by how you treat the least among you, the poor, you know, the disempowered, the devalued, the degraded, right? Right, the vulnerable. And so he said, I took up that. And look at what he told us. I'm telling you, I said, I think I said it before, but I want to tell you, and the same thing with Malcolm. He says to us, we, we are more a social vanguard, right? And what we do, we transform this country and the world. And so we should so struggle that years from now, historians would have to pause and say, there lived a great people, a black people, who through their struggle injected a new meaning and dignity in the veins of civilization. This is our challenge an overwhelming responsibility. And Nana Mary Clavethune said, you know, our task is to remake the world. It's nothing less than that. So we must have, we're talking about identity, we must have a world and confidence identity. In Swahili, we had two words for a human being. Watu is a strict, just human being, which is people, good. And then Walimwengu, which means world being. So we're both human beings and world being. And we must always be concerned with the well-being of the world and all in it, right? So that's the thing I like. And when people say, and this is again an identity question, people say when you put black in front of it, it somehow inferiorizes it, right? But they say you can't have a black agenda for the country, right? Because it's too narrow. Even our brother Obama, I can talk about him now. I, I defended him during his presidency because the wild people were out there howling at the moon and stuff, all right? So I had to defend him by that, but I still offer the criticism because we can't have selective morality and no one is immune from criticism. But so uh, what, what happens here is that he would say, well, I can't take y'all as gender uh, because it's just black. I'm not the president of uh, black people. I'm the president of the whole country. Hey, comrade, you didn't say that to the gay people. You didn't say that to the Latino. You didn't say that to the labor movement. You didn't say that to the Jews. You know you didn't say it to the Jews. So why are you coming here talking to us like Bill Cosby about television and stuff? So I'm saying to us, we have to have an expanded conception of ourselves and we have to reject the pathological, the pathological language that a pathological society generates. We're in a sick society and it generates sick people, right? And it makes us talk in sick ways about 
us and other oppressed people. And we have to stop that. I don't believe all of us do this. I'm just talking about it's a big enough problem for us to pay attention to. I never condemn all black people. I think we are beautiful people. We're sacred people. We have endured and adapted and been resilient and resourceful in ways other people haven't. And we experienced and overcome and prevailed in situations that might have killed other people. But here we are continuing not only to survive, but to develop and prevail. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And we must talk like that. So again, just to close out, the martyrdom of Malcolm. Malcolm had a chance to walk away. He could have stayed in Africa, right? And lived like a head of state. That's how they received him. That's how they treated him. But he went, he came back to almost certain death because he loved his people. He gave his life so that we could live fuller and more freer and more beautiful one and more meaningful lives, right? That's the beauty. So I don't want it to be dismissed when he was assassinated. Yes, we have to say that because we have to crit criticize and condemn those who did it. But we must also say, what did he do? He could have walked away and he would not walk away until the war was won, until the struggle was won. And that's a beautiful example. And we must teach that everywhere and all the time. Directly, the concept of operational unity comes out of my philosophy, Kawaita which I developed and out of which I created both Kwanzaa, the Pan-African holiday Kwanzaa, which is a celebration of family, community and culture and in Guzo Saba, the seven principles of Kawaita and of our, our Kwanzaa. In fact, I created in Guzo Saba before I created Kwanzaa and I've created Kwanzaa not only to reaffirm uh, for three reasons, I, I, I need to say that first to reaffirm our rootedness in African culture. I would not let them lift us out of our own culture and make us simply a footnote and forgotten casualty in theirs. I wanted to return to our history and culture as African people, as Black people who are self-conscious and committed, right, and in struggle, constantly to be ourselves and to free ourselves, because there's a dual aspect to our culture uh, struggle when I come back. So uh, then the second reason I create Kwanzaa to give us a time when we all over the world could come together, reaffirm uh, the awesome meaning of being African in the world, reaffirm the bonds between us, right? And meditate on the awesome meaning of being African in the world, right? And all over the world now, on every continent in the world, throughout the world African community, people celebrate Kwanzaa and raise up the question of what does it mean to Af be African? What does it mean? Uh, to Af what does Africa have to say about what it is to be human, what it is to have a family, what it is to raise our children, what is the right relationship with the environment, right? How do we treat the stranger and the immigrant? How do we, in fact, struggle to support good in the world? And one of the things I think, and we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but we're talking about writing. I always said that one of the things we have to realize is that writing must be a part of the people's practice, right? That is to say mm, that writing cannot be separated from the people themselves, right? And, and one, one of the things that happens here is a lot of times people say art for art's sake, but Langston Hughes and other people had this conversation during the Renaissance, right? There's no art for art's sake. If art was just for art's sake, people just paint and lick it and sing it and won't be nobody over there. Just do it for art's sake. You don't want nobody here. The moment you want somebody here, you made it a social issue. And just like people have, you have a right to present your work, people have a right to respond to that work. Some of it's going to be good, some of it's going to be critical, but you never see. I say art is for human sake. I say knowledge is for human sake. That's what my culture teaches me. There is no art for art's sake, no knowledge for knowledge sake. Knowledge is always for human sake. And what is this art supposed to do except bring added beauty and meaning to our lives as a people? This art is supposed to raise us up, expand our consciousness and our conception of ourselves and the world. This art is supposed to support the struggle of people to be themselves and to free themselves and to live full and meaningful lives. It is supposed to be dignity affirming, not dignity denying. It's supposed to speak to the best of what it means to be African and human in the world. I think we need to ask that. 
Now, whether people do it or not, doesn't mean whether we ask it or not. I think I have to ask it as a, as a saver, as a moral teacher, as a teacher in general, I have to ask that we bring forth the best of what it means to be African in him. So I said, oh, we've got different uh, 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 conceptions of what it means to be beautiful, or good, right? But that's what we need to argue about. That's the beauty of it. Let's argue over this, right? I'm going to do it with principle, right? Don't get mad because somebody doesn't think the way you do. Challenge it. Truth not born of struggle is not trustworthy, right? We got to struggle over these ideas, right? And so when we write, we're struggling to present ideas that are worthy of being receptive. When we paint, we're painting to do what? To present a conception of aesthetics, of beauty that is worthy of acceptance, worthy of praise. Rescue me if I'm wrong, right? Nobody just paints to be ugly. Nobody writes to be wrong, you know, unless they got issues, you know, I mean, there's always people got issues, right? So I think it's very important for us. So operation of unity means unity in the virtue, unity without conformity. What I said in the 60s, I stand by now. Oh, the third reason I created Quantum was to introduce and reaffirm in Guzu Sala, the seven principles, Umoja, unity, Kujichagalia, self-determination, Ujima, collective work and responsibility, Ujima, cooperative economics, neo-purpose, Guma, creative, and Imani faith. So operational unity, I repeat, means unity in diversity, unity without uniformity, unity in purpose and principled practice, right? We don't have any obligation to unite with people who are just doing us wrong or abusing us, right? We got to insist on moral practices and moral relationships with each other. And we always to say this, we condemn you not for what you are, or even, pardon me, we condemn you not for what you were, or even for what you are, but we criticize you for what you refuse to be. You must be excellent. If African is to mean anything, it must be excellence. And we must strive for excellence in all we do. That's one of the lessons from my ancestors. It says, strive for excellence in all you do. Mary McClavidum, Nana Mary McClavidum, it says, this is about our ceaseless striving and struggles to bring good into the world. And that's, of course, from the Oduifa. It says, let's do things with joy. For sure, Oduifa is sacred text of the ancient Yoruba land. And it's still a current text, of course. The Oduifa 781 said, let's do things with joy. For surely, humans have been chosen to bring good into the world. And we say, that's the fundamental mission and meaning of human life. So whether you are a writer, a journalist, a judge, a teacher, a student, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever you are, you have a mission in life to take your path and to use it, take your profession, your vocation, and use it to bring good into the world, to sustain good in the world, and to not, as the text said, not let any good be lost. So that's what operational unity is about. Recognizing we don't have to be totally unified on everything. We must find common ground. That's what happens when we talk about mixed people. Mixed people can claim whatever identity they want. But if we're talking about common ground, it's our blackness that pulls us together, right? We can be those other things. People, people say, I got many identities. Why are you saying just one identity, right? Uh, because you have to have this concept of identity, which speaks to sameness. Identity speaks to sameness, Black people. It speaks to sameness that a person, a people, or a thing has enough of to distinguish its similar characteristics and to be identified as a unity, right? It means being the same, being it's a thing, being itself, a person or people being itself, not something else. And in the end, here's how I define identity in a relational way. That is, identity is the reality and sense of self. Listen now, the reality and sense of self rooted in relationships and in the sensitivities, thought and practice of our people in a word, in a culture, recognizing diversity, and yet finding sameness and common ground. That's what we're talking about. And so we embrace all, before we didn't even have these discussions with 
uh, the mixed people in our in our life. It doesn't mean it's wrong for them to uh, claim uh, both sides of themselves or three or four sides of themselves. It doesn't mean that people can't say I'm gay or lesbian. It doesn't mean that they can or trans, right? They can say that, but they can be that with white people, but they can only be black with us. So it's what is common to us that brings us to ink, that brings us to this moment to discuss the ancient richness, beauty, sacredness, and goodness of our people and their awesome march through human history. That's what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that is very important is to maintain tradition in the midst of change, continuity in the midst of transition and change. And that means holding on to core principles, core principles like the Nguzo Saba. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm with that. I, no matter what happens in the next two zillion millennia, that's still a good message. The good message is in Maat, the moral idea in ancient Egypt, right? We, can, we still have to practice the seven cardinal virtues, truth, justice, propriety, harmony, balance, reciprocity, and righteous order. No matter what happens, we will still have to respect the transcendence, right? Whether you call it God or whether you call it a principle, we must have something that is beyond violation, devaluation, and degradation to start with. So we know that we have a sense of ethical values. Second, the, 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 the rights and dignity of the human person. Third, the well being and flourishing of family and community. Next, the co op, the mutual, uh, the reciprocal solidarity and cooperation for mutual good of humanity. And finally, the integrity and well being of the earth, of the environment, right? So always I can sum all of that up into this is a moment to continue the struggle for African and human good and the well being of the world. We cannot be diverted by toys in our hand called technology, right? And feel that somehow this could control us rather than us. People are addicted to the phone, right? So they, they make relationships suffer. I call people, I try to call them sometimes. <laughs> My people want to give me a short text. I, I would do it with them, right? I got to do emails, so much going on, right? But I never forget. What is the best way to relate to human beings? And it is to be in their presence and to hear their voice and to feel them present and alive and healthy and well and seeking goodness in the world. So at this moment, I think more than others, we are challenged to reaffirm humanity in its wholeness, to reaffirm our Africanness in its wholeness, not to split up into 50 million identities, but to reaffirm the common ground. You asked me earlier what multiculturalism is, right? Multiculturalism is not food, fashion, and festival. That's, you know, that's nothing, right? It's a symbolic act. Multiculturalism is a depthful appreciation, a profound appreciation of diversity that expresses itself in these basic ways. First, mutual respect for each people and culture as a unique and equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world. I wanna repeat that. Mutual respect, this is the first principle of multiculturalism, mutual respect for each people and culture as a unique and equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world. No superiority, no inferiority, no one, no hierarchy, but each people, Equal, unique, but equally valid and equally valuable ways of being human. I'm an African. This is the way I'm human. I don't even ask me to be other than African. I'm th hey, comrade, go tell somebody else that. We have to reaffirm who we are as African people, right? We have too much history behind us. What does it mean for me to jump out of my history and leave Harry Tubman? Not a Harry Tubman or not a Malcolm or Nana Martin King, or Nana Fannie Lou Hamer, or Nana Ella Baker, or Anna, Nana Ella, Anna Jukov, and all those people who died on the battlefield for something better. What kind of person would I be if I abandoned that history because somebody told me I'm something else? Hey, 
I can be something else, but I got to be me. I don't want to sound like Sammy. I got to be me. And that me is African, right? That me is African. That's my starting point. If I leave that, who am I? When I say those questions, which I never finished, <laughs> those three questions, who am I? Am I really who I am? And am I all I ought to be? I didn't do the last one. Who am I? Who am I in history and culture? I know myself in relationship. I'm not just hanging in the air, right? Ideas don't come from the, they don't drop from the sky. They don't grow from the ground. They don't float in from the sea. We write with the ideas of the dominant society unless we dare to challenge that. And I say again and again, we are American by habit and African by choice. And we must every day choose to be African, choose to be, be the best of what it means to be African and human in the world. We don't even have to think to be American. We get up, we might even whistle Dixie if it becomes a favorite tune and be played on television regularly. So we have to watch those things. We can't let our oppressor be our teacher, right? And so I think it's very important for us to always choose to be African. I say choose to be African. Our struggle is always to be ourselves and to free ourselves, right? To be African, to be human, to live dignity affirming, life enhancing and world preserving ways taught to us by ancestors. We must be ourselves to free ourselves. We can't be ourselves we can't free ourselves if we don't be ourselves. If we say we're not black, then we can't say black lives matter. We can't say the police and the system are, which are killing us because we're black. We just denied it. So we have to say we're black regardless of what other things we are, right? That's, for me, that's my primary identity, not male, right? Not those other things I can list that I am, right? I'm just saying my primary identity is uh, uh, African and the other ones are secondary tertiary, et cetera, right? So we struggle to be ourselves in order to free ourselves. But we can't fully be ourselves until we fully free ourselves. So we're trying to expand the realm of freedom in this country and the world so we can speak our special African culture truth. The second point of multicultural, that was too long. The second point of multiculturalism is mutual, uh, the, the, the mutual respect for the right and responsibility of each people to speak its own special culture truth and make its own unique contribution to how this society is reconceived and reconstructed and how we engage the world. Each people must decide that. Third, the constant search for common ground in the midst of our diversity. I've always stressed diversity, but I want to stress common ground, not only inside of our uh, group and our community, not just our national community, but our world community is African. But also respect diversity and common ground with others. How do we live in this society with other people? We have to speak this. Du Bois told us, don't let the dominant society so entice us. Don't let the dominant society so entice us that we forget we have our own special message to speak. And then we become, he said, people who feel closer to Germany than to Africa. I'm going to Paris this week. Hey, all right, okay. But what are you doing as African people? What do you do to reaffirm the beauty and goodness is sacred and to enhance the development of African people? And then third, fourth, uh, multiculturalism is mutual commitment to an ethics of sharing. We've got to share the world. We got to share status. White people can't be the central point, the subject of every sentence, right? The source of all education and things. We've been fighting to, you know, change that, and we have to continue to change that. How can one eighth of the world's population eliminate seven eighths of the world's population from dialogue, discussion, and decision making? Right? We got to change that. It's, it's not even debatable at this point. And then, of course, the shared. Um, shared status, each human being. We're the ones who gave the world, by the way, the concept that humans are in the image of God. That was us. As early as uh, 2140 in the book of Keti, in the Husiya, right? Keti says this, that we're in the image of God, came from his very person. And second, we are the ones who introduced the concept of human dignity, that people have an inherent worthiness, regardless, and, and that that worthiness, that inborn worthiness has three characteristics. It's transcendent, it is equal 
and it is inalienable, transcendent of all social and biological characteristics we might have. Race, class, gender, sexuality, age, ability, nationality, religion, etc. Second, it's equal in all, no hierarchy. And finally, guess what? It is inalienable. No one can take it away from it. You can't even give it away. So those are the things I think we need to hold to. We got to hold to ourselves. We got to be ourselves in order to free ourselves and expand the realm of freedom in this country and the world. And other people see us as a moral and social board vanguard. They borrow our moral vocabulary and our moral vision all over the world, sing our songs of liberation and pose our struggle as a model to emulate. One of the most important <clears throat> fields of study and one of the most important practices we can engage in is ethical study and ethical practice. I believe that every issue of any importance today that we face has an ethical dimension to it. As Amica, Nana Amica Kabara said, that even though our demands might be political, they always carry an ethical uh, element, an ethical character to them, right? So when we talk freedom, we're talking ethics. When we talk justice, we're talking ethics. We're talking what is right and wrong, which serves African and human good and the well being of the world, not just humans, but the environment itself. So we're talking about rightful relationship, rightful conduct, rightful conceptions of ourselves, each other, and the world. And ethics gives us a foundational understanding we need to properly assert ourselves in the world. How we understand ourselves shapes and determines how we assert ourselves. And if we have a diminished or unethical, immoral, evil understanding of ourselves, that's how we will assert ourselves. And so we must have an expansive, an ethical and effective, an effective understanding of ourselves so we can assert ourselves in the most ethical, effective, and expansive ways. And so that's why I went back to school to get the second doctorate. You know, I had the first doctor in political science with specialization in African-American nationalism. And then I, I said uh, we to our organization, us, we need to have an ethical position. Now, we always talked about values. We've always said values are key to everything. Values are categories of commitment, priority, and human possibility. Because what you think is important and what you put as priority dictates your human possibilities, right? If you put more emphasis on money, right, and greed than you do on human life, human health, then yes, you can actually hoard vaccines and watch people die around the world and give some silly explanation for it or just not even mention it. So we have to be the social and moral vanguard of this country. We have to speak truth first to the people and then to power. Speak truth to the people that frees them from illusions. One of the greatest struggles in writing and in life is the struggle not only against what is called ignorance or unawareness, but the struggle against illusion. And America is a house of illusions. And the difference is that with ignorance or unawareness, you present knowledge, but with illusion, like stolen elections or the vaccine is nothing but poison, even though you're taking measles vaccine, you've been used to it. That illusion is difficult to get away because ignorance is simply the absence of knowledge, but illusion is the assumption of knowledge even in its absence. Ignorance is the absence of knowledge, but illusion is the assumption of knowledge even in its absence. So how do you convince people who think they know? People who say, I don't know, you give them the answer, they gone. But people who say they know, and it's wrong knowledge, and it's death dealing knowledge, killing other people, being irresponsible, don't care whether you wear a mask or don't care what you do to threaten the life, not even of your own children or your parents or your grandparents. And to go with Trump, I mean, look, this is what Malcolm said. Not a Malcolm X said that a lot of times, well, he said one of the most important things we can do today is think for ourselves. That's an ethical responsibility to think for ourselves and to think deeply and to engage in what the ancient Egyptians called nizh, nizh ken, 
which is uh, um, courageous questioning. He said, one of the most important things we can think do is think for ourselves. He said, because one of the things that's happening here is the media and the dominant society is molding our opinion. And a lot of times when we think we've thought of this ourselves, it's somebody that taught us to think that way. Just think about that. Imagine if this whole conversation is to keep black people from taking the vaccine so that they can kill them. That does something to people's concept of conspiracy when it's reversed and you think about it from another point. I'm just saying, look at it from that point. People think taking a vaccine is going to kill them. Suppose the conversation is now don't take it and that kills you. We know the statistic, the majority of people that die now, that get it, are the people who are not vaccinated. That's real. The rest is just illusion. So I think it's very important for us to think morally. And I think that one of the other things I want to do as a, one of the founding scholars of Black Studies is to bring an expanded concept of the ethical. Usually we think of the ethical as what is Christian or Jewish or Muslim. That's the Abrahamic traditions. But the majority of the people in the world don't follow those faiths. So what is it that we ought to think about? We should think in a multicultural way. What did Africans think before the coming of the European? What did we think? And there is no ethics more re rich or mm, depthful and more meaningful to us than ancient Egyptian, ancient Yoruba, or Ifa tradition ethics, but you have to know it. So I wanted to bring that into black studies and I wanted to bring it into the movement. And now I think it's well established. The ethics of Ifa, the ethics of Vat are there. A lot of times people uh, don't know where it came from, but they say it and they are dealing with it, right? But we put this, our organization, us decided this was an important initiative for me to go back to school to get my doctorate. I could do it, I could do it with independent study, but I wanted to be challenged, you know, you, you get your strength, not from simply listening to people that like you, but going in the enemy's camp, turning over the table, putting a new agenda on the table, right? Struggling, struggling over truth, struggling over what is good, right? That's the beauty of it, to bring your contribution to the conversation, not feel good that you've mastered somebody else's civilization, that you've mastered some other, other way of understanding things, you know? So I think it's very important for us to think deeply about our lives and to remember what all of our great leaders have told us. We are a central moral and social vanguard. We are a key people in a key country and our liberation will not only free us, but bring this country and the whole world closer to full and final liberation. Thank you, Al. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Al. Um, yes. Wonderful moderator as always. Uh, you. you are uh, just a really great representative of our community here in Minnesota. We appreciate you. you. And to all of the uh, participants and folks who are still jumping on as we speak, as we end, <laughs> um, I want to say thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Thank you for being challenged and taking on the challenge to hopefully take the words of our honored guest, Elder Saba, Dr. Milana Karenga, and all of his wisdom and shared knowledge uh, with you as you leave and go back into the community just to make it a better place. I um, really, we're honored and we appreciate you being here, Dr. Karenga. And we know that uh, Saba Tiamoya is- That's right and we want to thank her and honor her for being with you <laughs> all the way, stepping, you know, hey, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, we are partners. And same here for my, my partner, Brother Nura as well. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But That's I also good. want to uh, thank the collaborative. We want to thank um, Mary Terrace from Strive Publishing uh, for seeing the vision and actually helping and moving these um, uh, things that we had to move to get this going. I want to thank uh, Dr. Artika Tyner from Planting People Growing Justice, Brother Nur, of course, from Papyrus Publishing, and um, Wise Inc. as well. And we want to just say, I know from all of what you shared, a quote from um, 
our brother James Baldwin comes to mind. He had said, you know, I was a black kid that was expected to write from that perspective. Yet I had to realize that the black perspective was dictated by the white imagination. So with that, I want us to really encourage ourselves to really seek within our own imagination, our own perspective, mm. and celebrate that and put that in the front because that's, like you said, um, uh, Dr. Karinga, that's who we are. So with mm -hmm. that, I wanna thank everyone for being here and hope you have a blessed day, a wonderful rest of the week. And there've been lots of questions in, in the chat. We will try to share the, um, the actual recording of this on our site and we'll send we'll send a link to you directly um dr karinga and we'll also share whatever comments or questions so if people want to follow up at a later time thank uh, you so that'd much. be great and then we also got some information from Saba uh Tiamoye in the chat in regards to uh resources and ways that they can access additional um information from what you have shared today. So thank you once again, and we really appreciate you. And if you could sit still for a minute, but we wanna say goodbye or not goodbye, but tutu anana to the rest Thanks of our guests. Time. See you all later. Um,